Hello, everyone. My name is Maria Thomas, and I work for Allianz Research, the global team of economists, strategists, sector advisors, and foresight experts of the Allianz Group, led by Ludovic Subron. Welcome to Tomorrow, a podcast where we'll be talking about our latest analyses of economic and capital market developments, as well as our views on trends affecting risk management. Let's get started. The trade-offs between affordability and insurability are becoming more difficult to solve. But are we heading towards an uninsurable future? In this episode, we find out from Arna Holzhausen, Jasmine Gershaw, and Marcus Zimmer from Allianz Research. Hello, Arna, Jasmine, and Marcus. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, Hello, Maria. Maria. Hello. So with rising global risks from natural disasters to geopolitical uncertainty, do you think we're heading towards an uninsurable future? Well, I think it's really a clear and present danger. If climate change continues as in the past and if temperature rises as in the last couple of years, we will, yeah, sooner than later, live in a three-degree world. And that is for insurance industry a very challenging world, to put it mildly. So what we have to do, we have to double down our efforts for the decarbonization of our economies. We have to accelerate the green transformation in big time. Basically, we have to achieve in the next yeah, decade, I would say, what we not achieved in the last 30 years. So it's really, really a big challenge. And we should not be naive here. For sure, technology will be a big part of the story. We need all the new technologies from hydrogen to carbon capture and storage. That will be indispensable. But on the other hand, it will be not enough. Another ingredient to achieve the Paris targets will be behavioral change. Without changing our lifestyles, we will be not able to reach the goal of 1.5 degree temperature rise. So that's the simple truth that our lifestyles are not sustainable. Our carbon footprint is way too high. So we have to face these challenges in our own lives as well. What are some of the compromises you expect consumers will have to make? The question is really for consumers how much we are willing to basically trade in for the climate. So for consumers, it's really the question with higher um, inflation rates and lower growth. Um, we're basically forced to um, adapt our uh, budget um, and f- like see how much is basically affordable. Um, the question is not so much for green products, uh, whether they're available, they're widely available, um, but the challenge is really that there is a rising green premium that we would have to bring down for consumers actually to consume more of these products. And one way to do this is basically to implement higher carbon prices, which would then lead to higher prices for the more conventional goods. Um, and the green goods or the more environmental friendly goods would um, stay at a similar level, right? So we really need to incentivize consumers that could be through like companies or governments could do that um, to actually purchase these. Um, For example, tax breaks would help or also subsidies for green products. I mean, if we look at the numbers, for example, in 2022, uh, the market share of green products was about like 17 percent. So quite a share, but not too big. And the green premium was still 27.6%. So there was still nearly third, like a third of the price higher than conventional products. And that's really challenging. On the other hand, we have the challenge that if everybody would switch to green products, um, our supply chains basically won't hold. We wouldn't be able to produce um, as many green products at the moment as uh, there might be in demand. Uh, The best example is food. Uh, So if everybody would switch to um, organic produced food, which is more sustainable, um, this wouldn't basically hold. So in the end, we really need a wide range of cost competitive, climate friendly and um, products. And um, finally, we need lifestyle changes. So, Marcus, would you want to add on the yeah. lifestyle changes? <laughs> no, I think, I think, particularly there is a, some good news also that you not always have a green premium for for things. So, if you think uh, of circularity, for example, um, you could actually save costs by switching to repairing more instead of simply replacing goods uh, through new goods. So, this is a particular prominent uh, uh, for repairing a car, for example, to, to have a 
exam something that's close to insurance business. So um, you can you can save up to eighty uh, percent of emissions uh, for a, a standard damage that you have on a car simply by uh, changing the way that the claims are handled. And also, uh, if you think of uh, circularity, you you can think of different ownership models than we typically have today. You can think uh, of a product as a service. So where you don't buy uh, the product, don't buy the car, but you basically have, uh, you, you pay for the mobility service. Um, this is interesting from a, a cost perspective and from a longevity perspective, because then the, the owner of the product uh, who sells you the service has a more integrated view on how uh, sustainable, how to, to run uh, this uh, product in a sustainable and cost-minimizing way, uh, maybe has different access to insurance also, and uh, can reduce insurance costs, uh, has a better view, a better connection to the producer of the good, and so could incentivize better to already uh, embed sustainability considerations in the design of the product and and the most important uh, uh, consideration there is uh, this EU legislation that we should have the right to repair. Um, this is not necessarily easy today uh, if you have a product to repair it at all. Also, independent repair shops might not have access to the necessary replacement parts or to the the, the you know the the repair handbooks uh, or things like that. So um, this is an important part in uh, establishing the, the, the infrastructure, uh, the databases, the access to uh, replacement parts, to repair handbooks, which will also reduce uh, the costs for repairing, uh, which in turn might also reduce then the costs for insurance again. Maybe to add to this, just in general, I think our lifestyles per se currently are unsustainable. So the way we travel, the way uh, we uh, build our houses, how we power and heat our homes. So in general, there needs to be change. And I think what Marcus just said is like, the, this is like one part of it. And the other part is that our existing social and economic structures are not made you know, like for these lifestyle changes. So basically, climate change also requires these behavioral changes in how we use our products, how long we use them, but also in general, how we live. So the most um, impactful actions everybody could actually do is, for example, to um, live car free, to avoid air travel as far as we can, uh, or also to adopt a plant-based diet. So it's really that everybody needs to look in their own lives, what can I actually change? And that can actually contribute to not reaching this uninsurable world in the end. Yeah. And as Yasmin already mentioned, housing, I think housing is a big, the elephant in the room because it's a big part of the puzzle we have to solve. And you mentioned this is the construction, but I think all, even more important is the place where we live, where do we build the houses and what we have seen in the past that often there's a tendency by policy makers to not to really reveal, not really to disclose the real risks to, to have regulation to have subsidies in place to lower the insurance premium so that people do not understand really what kind of risks are involved in building houses, buildings, infrastructure in certain places. So and the result is that too many developments take place in risky areas and then we have too much exposure, then we have too much losses and in the next round we need even more subsidies to make it still affordable. And this is a vicious cycle that will be someday crash under its own weight. And we see already the writing on the wall. We have to look to Florida or to California, where we see that insurance companies stop uh, underwriting new policies for home insurance. And that's something we have really to address. And there are some steps we can take. For sure, we have to invest in resilience. We need stronger infrastructure, stronger constructions, like in Japan, in, in response to, to zero frequent earthquakes in Japan. We need Smart partnerships, maybe have the state as a, yeah, playing the role of a reinsurer of last resort. And we need direct help. I think it's very, it's much better if we see the prices or premiums too high and become unaffordable for some households to give them direct support. 
to have targeted direct support for households that are really in need and not across the board subsidies for all. But also, ultimately, we have to think about reallocation because we can, with technology, with behavioral change, we can probably shift the limits of insurability, but we cannot remove them. And we have to accept that some places should not be for development. And then we have to think if we made pa in the past mistakes, how we can correct them. And this means uh, relocation, resettlements should be also on the agenda in order to make a more sustainable living for all of us. And we, sh we shouldn't forget, you know, if uh, if we call for the state to step in, uh, this is costs, and uh, in the end, these costs get redistributed somewhere else. So it's it's the, the society that pays for those individuals that irrationally uh, take these higher risks. The the, the term uh, that we use in insurance is moral hazard. So that that uh, by that describes that uh, because. Uh, you don't have to pay for your own risk. Uh, mm -hmm. You you ignore it and just do something uh, and build somewhere which doesn't make sense out of, out of a risk perspective. And this is not sustainable. It's it's not also uh, this shouldn't be forgotten uh, in the debate that it's it's not the state that pays for this support, but the the, the money comes from. From Texas, so it's it's we uh, that pay for that. So uh, we really have to think uh, as a society what we want to, uh, where we want to step in, where it's really about a uh, just transfer of of funds, and um, it's also problematic because if if the environmental conditions change, the the people that have been living there for a long while, it's not their fault that weather patterns change. Uh, because uh, we as a global society ignored the, 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 the harmful uh, impacts of, of uh, our emissions. Yeah, I still believe in the yeah, self-responsibility of most of the peoples, of most of the citizens. If you give them the right information, if you have really risk-adequate prices, if you disclose the risks, then most people will adapt and most people will probably take the right steps to adjust and to adapt to this new risk landscape. I think the problem right now is that we too often try to to conceal these risks try to 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 have a fuzzy logic applied so that nobody really knows what's on at stake and this has to change i, I pretty much believe that it's not the, the solution would be not a state led a transformation where the state has as in any state to with regulation and rules beside everything i think we have to clearly go back to a situation where we have all the tools at the hands of the responsible citizens and then we can move forward because in the end, I mean, if we talk about behavior changes, people have to want it. If they do not own it, if they are just told you have to adapt, then we will see a populistic backlash, then we will demonstrations in the street and to come to a situation where people really believe in this change, You have to give them the right information and the right tools at hand. And then I still believe that, that most people will behave responsibly. Yeah, which is not obvious. It's not not easy to get the necessary information. Yeah, but this is why we need also insurance. This is, I think there's a, it's a new role, but there's a very important role for insurance to play. It's not only that we, after disaster, uh, give some financial Uh, our payouts to compensate for the financial losses. I think it's before disaster hits. Insurance are the company, the industry that knows most about risks, natural risk for sure, climate risk, because we are in the business for hundreds of years. And that we have to educate our clients. We have to tell them what the risks are. We have to price the risk accordingly so that our clients have incentives to adapt, to change their behavior. I think this role going away from the simple product logic that we sell just the police and we pay you out if something happens to make you whole again after financial disaster to start thinking about how we can with our clients in a relationship-based uh, situation relationship-based services be the role playing the role as a risk manager risk consultant yeah. to really help them to prevent risk to avoid risk yeah. this is the most important thing if disaster strikes it's most of the time too late we have to come to a situation where we with our clients 
reduce risks and maybe lower the stakes. And this, I think, is possible. But this also requires quite a change of yeah, culture, business model for, for the insurance industry itself. That's the challenge we have ourselves. We have to face ourselves in this new risk landscape. And a more active and interactive role is, for example, uh, simple things like just um, um, informing our customers on an upcoming hail risk on their cell phone. So uh, please move your car away because otherwise it might uh, be damaged. Yeah. So this is, and there's a lot of risks that we can actually um, also maybe the handle the claims quicker through uh, insurance products uh, that, that are linked to uh, larger, like index-based insurance products that are linked to larger developments uh, and indicators, weather indicators, for example. No, I really, Max, I really like your example because I think it's many small steps that can amount to a big change and that makes the more world more sustainable. I mean, we don't have to think about this great efforts and the great challenges. Small steps will also lead us to the target of purpose. So what are the small steps for companies? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> what are the small steps? I think uh, for the companies, we need to think big. So, uh, <laughs> No, but your example is the cell phones, <laughs> that you have this kind of messaging, that you are able to move your car in the garage before the hail still comes, because normally you park outside. And this kind of that you really... As, as just mean also say, this is diet, plant-based diet, that you probably reduce a little bit your consumption of meat. It's not a big deal, but if everybody does it and everybody's steps then amount to a lot of change, I would say. And for the companies, yeah, you're right. I mean, those, what are small steps? Those are big steps. But I think it starts with this, with this change of culture, with this change of thinking. And this is also something that's probably not... Uh, the most difficult to achieve, I would also say, but it's not yeah. impossible in my view. Maybe to add to this, I think also like the investment part for companies is really important, mm -hmm. right? On the one hand, like uh, where do they invest and do they actually invest in green assets or in more in greener assets and more in conventional assets? I think that's one thing because obviously, I mean, if firms want to invest in green technologies, it has to be profitable. So um, it's different than like for the state, for example. Um, so it really has to be profitable. Um, and what we've seen is that um, over the last two years, basically the funds that go into green technologies have actually increased. Um, massively, but they have to increase further. And the other question for companies I see on the investment side is also how much do they actually put in innovation? So, in basically in, in green innovation, in innovation in green technologies that could partially at least save our day, maybe. And um, there, I think um, this can also be supported by the state a bit by providing the playing field um, for the companies. Um, but the funding um, that is provided obviously has to become. Uh, has to come from from the private companies in general. And um, so um, what we actually see from the data a bit is that green innovation has slowed down in many economies over the last couple of years um, because of higher uncertainty basically surrounding these investments. So that's, uh, I would say, rather a bad, bad signal for, for where we're heading. Um, also, like green patent filing have dropped by minus 7% between 2015 and 2021. Um, so, um, but there's also, um, light at the end of the tunnel. So some countries actually invest more in green technologies that could help us get out of this. Um, so for example, Australia, China, the Czech Republic or Denmark are countries, um, that invested more in environmental friendly patents, um, where companies are actually um, helpful in pushing the transformation and, um, helping us to not reach this uninsurable world, maybe. Um, but obviously, I mean, there's, there's more to get us on track, um, to, to actually get out of the situation. Yeah, we had a huge jump in renewable investment. So this this increased 50%, which is tremendous. So uh, last year was a very good good um, year for renewable energy, for example. Yeah. Um, but I think in, in general, the, the issue with green investments versus conventional investments is that the green investment often have a different payoff profile in, in two dimensions. Uh, one point is that they usually have more higher payoffs in, in the future and further away, which simply uh, then if you discount a lot, uh, makes this investment very unattractive. I mean, you're always happy 
in the future if you have done it. Uh, but um, this is the what we call the tragedy of the horizon. So, so in an environment and currently in an environment with, with high interest rates, high inflation, you you really uh, this shortens your horizon for uh, when you want the, the investment to pay off. Um, this is something that particularly also the insurance industry and the asset owners maybe can support as they have a, a very long uh, horizon in, in, in their investments. So uh, they are a good partner for uh, financing this, this type of, of green investments. Another thing is uh, a difference in the payoff is that for the green projects, uh, part of the payoff doesn't uh, show with the, in the books of the investor. But you have this this positive externality, so you have this this benefit for the general society. Or the other thing around with the conventional or the brown, in, with particularly with the brown investments, uh, part of the costs don't show up in your uh, private uh, pockets. Uh, but the costs are um, partly covered by by other companies by society. And uh, this is what we generally term as the tragedy of the commons. So really this disconnect from uh, where uh, do the cost of the, the project uh, show up in private versus society and where do the benefits of the project show up in private versus society. And um, there, the in, in general, I think um, the finance sector can uh, play an important role by uh, coordinating this more. Because in the end, everybody has an interest that, that, uh, I have an interest that the others invest in green because I get a benefit from that. So what we need to achieve is this coordination that everyone participates in that. So that, that I don't take the position, oh, everybody else invests green. So I can make a lot of money by not participating in this. Uh, so this is this is something that that um, the that we very actively try to support also by engaging in um, in in for example the United Nations Net Zero Asset Owner Alliance uh, that that tries to formulate formulate guidelines uh, for the emission footprints of our investment and asset portfolios, for example. No, fully agree, but I think also that little help from the policymakers is necessary for that. And if, if you mention the, the tragedy of the horizons, the tragedy of the commons, I think we have all the instruments in place. We know what how this can be addressed and we cannot under overestimate the role of the tax system. Here. Yes. And seeing this is very important and this can shift the, 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 the thinking of the investors and the investors very much. And I think it's important that the policymaker act here and act in a reliable and in the credit worst way that they not change by the, in the first protest come and then they say oh we have to, to cancel or to, to scrap the subsidies or we have to lower the tax. I think it's very important that policy makers stick to their course and have long term reliabilities that we have reliable frameworks not only for this year but for the next 10 years. But I know it's very difficult. This is a challenge. And this is something we have to make clear that we need this kind of yeah, uh, frameworks that really are not only made for the next election cycle, but that are really made yeah. for the long term, for the long run. Because then also investors can adapt and then also savers can adapt and then we will solve these tragedies you mentioned. So that's, but it's a challenge for the policymakers for sure. And we come full circle back to the first, for, for you started off with the carbon pricing, which is, uh, I think, probably one of the best instruments uh, that policymakers have at hand to really foster this this um, cooperative uh, equilibrium that you want to reach. Um, and of course, the, the, the same thing in the other direction is to lower the fossil fuel subsidies. So we have the carbon pricing on the one hand, but uh, actually we not only uh, price carbon, but we, we subsidize uh, carbon usage uh, currently still on, on, a, on a broad level. So we can we can we should start off with uh, eliminating that. My last question was going to be about what is the role of the insurance industry in all this, but I think you kind of answered it. So what is the one takeaway you want to end on? To summarize this in one sentence, that's not easy. I think we know what to do. 
and you know that everybody is asking me. I mean, we stress the role of taxes, we stress the role of policymakers, we stress the role of investors, but in the end, it's everyone. It's every single person that have to take responsibility to lower her or his carbon footprint. And if this is things in, and if this everybody accepts, then I think I'm pretty confident that we will manage the transition in a good way. Thank you so much for listening. You can find the full report we just spoke about on our website. We'll leave a link in the show notes. If you'd like to discover more of our research, you can also follow the Ludonomics newsletter on LinkedIn. We'll leave a link down below for that too. If you like the podcast, please send it to any of your friends who might like it too, and leave us a rating and a review. We'd love to hear your feedback. In the meantime, stay tuned for the next episode.